AI designed drugs. So right now to get a new drug approved and on pharmacy shelves in America, you're looking at $2.7 billion in R&D and over 10 years on average, right? AI can really ingest mind-bending amounts of data, design new drugs for us, help speed up the regulatory process. This is already happening. There's already uh, over a dozen drugs, AI design drugs uh, in pipelines, and they're doing it much, much faster. In fact, um, Google, Google DeepMind just spun out a new company that signed deals with, I think, no, um, Novo Nordst and, um, and Eli Lilly to, to, to basically design drugs quicker and faster. Hi, and welcome to Wealthy On. I'm James Conner. Everywhere we look, artificial intelligence or AI is a topic of discussion, and everyone is adopting an AI strategy. But is AI a fad like the metaverse or Web3 or NFTs, or is it here to stay? To help answer this question, my guest today is Stephen McBride, Chief Analyst at Risk Hedge. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for joining us today. How are things in Dublin? James, great to be back on Wealthy On and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, look, the restaurants are packed, the streets are busy. Um, but, you know, look, I'm, I'm, not too, I'm not too positive on the future of Europe. I believe innovation is the thing that creates prosperity and European bureaucrats have tricked themselves into believing that they want to lead on regulation and uh, regulating AI and regulating crypto and all these technologies. That's the way to create wealth. So look, long term, um, I, I couldn't be more bearish on Europe. <laughs> the Europeans love implementing policies. They, they never met a technology that they didn't like to regulate, right? And the thing about, you just think about why was the internet such a big deal? I would argue was because in the early days, we largely left it alone. We left it to flourish, right? You think about trying to regulate the internet in 93. How could you ever have foreseen all the wealth that the internet will create, all the new companies it will create, um, and all the jobs it will create. And um, you think about what they're doing with, with AI now, right? They've already implemented an AI act. So I think, look, this is just going to continue to drive innovation uh, offshore, drive companies offshore. My fellow countryman, uh, Stripe co-founder, Patrick Collison, uh, you know, he, he wrote a blog post saying, could Stripe have been created in Ireland? And the answer was no because you have all these regulations, you have banks not willing to deal with startups. So, um, you know, I think it, this is very good for Canada. Your country is very good for America and elsewhere. Um, but I don't see much happening in Europe. So you are currently in Dublin, but you're actually making a move to Abu Dhabi here in the coming year. And I'm curious, why do you want to move there? Why not move to London or Paris? Yeah, so I've been to Dubai and Abu Dhabi many times, James, and I was just incredibly impressed by the forward-looking nature of the company, or, or the country, sorry. They get almost all their drinking water from desalinization plants, and they're just uh, finished construction and opened their fourth nuclear power plant. You think about what that country was 30 years ago, right? Go look, it was, it was one or two buildings uh, beside the seaside, small little fishing villages, and now you go and you see what they've been able to do. So really, I want my kids to grow up in an environment in a country around people that are strivers. Um, and Abu Dhabi ha and Dubai have that in abundance. You know, I think 85% of the population of the country is actually not Emirati. It's really a collection of people around the world who have moved there to build a better life for themselves. And, um, you know, I think I think I want my that 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 mentality to rub off on my kids. And also, you know, we're going to talk about AI. UAE is absolutely one of the, the leading countries outside of America on AI. Um, they've launched AI models. So that makes me even more bullish. And when I think about Abu Dhabi, I guess I think about billionaires, right? Is it what's the cost of living like there? And what's the cost of real estate or to own a home? Yeah, so look, obviously there's zero tax and um, it does come across as quite luxurious, but it's actually quite affordable. Um, I mean, you know, when you take into to consideration, I actually have a friend who just recently moved from Dubai to Toronto and he said, all in, Dubai is actually cheaper. That's despite paying, you know, 70, 80, 90 K uh, rent for a villa. Uh, to buy real estate is actually quite affordable. You would get a decent, you know, three bedroom villa in a nice area for half a million dollars. Um, so all in, when you consider you're not you're not paying taxes, it's actually it actually works out uh, cheaper in many ways. 
Well, that's interesting. Well, good luck on that. And I want to move on now and I want to talk about your firm, Risk Hedge. And your motto of the firm is turning disruption into wealth. What exactly do you mean by that? So, James, we really want to identify pockets of rapid change, right? Sectors, industries where things are changing fast and the companies in our experience in rapid growth. Um, and specifically, you know, we call those mega trends, right? You can think of AI. Or that's, that's the one that's on everyone's mind right now. Uh, and you want to focus specifically in great business within these sectors. I think that's, you know, you think about of a Venn diagram, fast growing trends, but great businesses. And um, the, the intersection of those two Venn diagrams is really where we focus. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what we mean by turning disruption into wealth. And you just think about the ability to buy companies, the ability to buy stocks. That's only existed for 400 years, which in the long arc of human history actually isn't that much. I always find it amazing that I can sit at this laptop here and I can buy shares in NVIDIA or Amazon or something like that. It's, it's, it's quite amazing when you think about it. And so, of course, you're doing a lot of work on artificial intelligence. What other sectors would fall into this category? So I think if you just picked one trend for the next decade, and by the way, we've been investing in AI since 2018, so we're, we're not new to the game. For me, AI and biotech are the two big trends that you want to focus most of your time on over the next decade. I think biotech, you know, you think about you think about waves of innovation, right? I, I would I would argue that for 50 years, we had incredible innovation in transportation, right? You had the Wright Brothers, uh, we went to the moon, you had supersonic jets, uh, you had cars, all these things. Then that's really switched to information technology, right? The computers, the internet, AI, and so forth. I think the next big 50-year trend is biotech, right? You're seeing cancer vaccines. You're seeing CRISPR cures that allow them people to cure or doctors to cure blindness and deafness in kids with eye drops or, or an injection in their ear. So really focused on do those two sectors right now. If you were to ask me my most contrarian idea, I still think crypto is extremely, va blockchain is extremely valuable. We can, we can absolutely talk about use cases there. But yeah, biotech and AI, I think a lot of money is going to be made in these sectors over the next uh, decade or two. So let's do a deeper dive on artificial intelligence or AI. John Chambers, the former CEO of Cisco, recently said that AI will power the stock market for the next 10 years. And it seems like every company out there is adopting some sort of AI strategy. And I guess my question to you is, is AI just another fad like Web3 or the metaverse, or is this a real game changer? I think it is a real game changer. And I think anyone who... who thinks different, really needs to use the technology, okay? This is unique in the sense that you can actually use AI, whereas kind of the metaverse or NFTs or, or even crypto, back when everyone was talking about it, it was very hard for the average person to get their hands on it, right? Right now, or anyone with an internet connection can go and check out the best AI the world has to offer on chatgpt.com, right? So I think it is... Um, a big game changer. I think it's an incredible productivity booster. You know, just earlier, I, I came across this paper, maybe I know a topic that, that you're interested in on the cost of building nuclear power plants, right? There's this dense 50 page document on why learning curves have, uh, haven't, ta haven't taken place in nuclear, why we don't build plants anymore. I could have spent 30 minutes reading the paper, right? Instead, I just uh, sent ChatGPT the, the document, ask it to summarize the main points and insights for me. And in 30 seconds, I had all I needed. Um, another thing that I really think it's going to help with is for anyone who homeschools their kids or just really wants to, to give their kids or grandkids a leg up, you can use it for educational purposes. You can create fun quiz and learning games out of AI. So I would encourage anyone who's a little bit skeptical of AI to actually use the technology. And alongside that, just look at what companies are saying about this. Alaska Airlines came out the other day, um, said uh, AI, uh, like it was it created an AI navigation system. It was almost like Google Maps in the air. I think it saved that 500 million um, gallons of fuel last year, just from shaving one or two minutes off each flight. Clarinet, the buy now, pay later company, we created an AI chatbot. It now does the work of 700 uh, agents, uh, handles calls quicker, 
and it's going to um, amount for it's going to create forty million dollars in profit for the company. So I understand AI is this big hyped up thing that people are saying, "Where is it all going? What is it used for?" Just look at the use cases, and you will see this is not a fad. So you mentioned Nvidia, and that's like the poster child for AI. And it recently went through an all-time high of $1,000. They just announced a 10-for-1 stock split. What are your thoughts on NVIDIA? Does it keep going or is it overdone here? And as a reminder, the market cap on NVIDIA now is $2.3 trillion. So, uh, you know, I've owned NVIDIA since 2018, so I'm a little bit biased or I'm speaking from a position of strength. Um, I did. We did sell half the position earlier this year. Uh, it's just to take profits after after it ran up so much. I believe it has further to run. Look, the biggest cash-rich companies in the world, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they're going to spend over $170 billion building AI data centers and, and other infrastructure this year. It's going to be over $200 billion next year. A huge amount of that money is going on chips, okay? So I don't think it's time to sell NVIDIA yet. I think it has further to run. I think before this bull run is over, it actually becomes the world's largest company, which would make me a little bit cautious. Maybe that is the sell signal. Um, but you actually look at where it's trading on a forward PE basis. As much as the stock has run up, um, its earnings have run up even faster. So uh, as of as of yesterday, or yeah, pre, pre-earnings, um, it, was, uh, it was trading near its five range uh, low, on the forward PE basis. So I think it has further to run, James. Um, I mean, yeah, as I said, the, it's actually it's actually more than justified the move it's had. So I have to admit, I haven't done much work on AI. And, and of course, I, I know about NVIDIA, but I don't know about any other names. What other names fall into the AI sector that I should be looking at? So I'm going to give you a, a very interesting story, James. So this, this phone here. So NVIDIA sells GPUs about about half the size of this phone, right? It gets TSMC to make them. It buys the chip from TSMC for about $700. It then packages it and just works all its magic. And then it sells it to Google and Microsoft for $30,000. And these chips have gotten about 100x faster. Not 100%, 100x faster over the past decade or so. The problem is that NVIDIA chips have gotten so much faster than everything else in the data center. Right. They've got you have think think about it. Um, think about it like this super fast thing in the data center. It's so fast that the rest of the data center, the cooling equipment, the storage, the fiber optic cables, the memory chips, they can actually not keep up with NVIDIA's chips. So the, the result of that is that these super powerful chips that suck up tons of energy and that, that's something that we can maybe talk about. And um, they only are actually operational about 30 percent of the time. Yet, they are, they are sucking power all the time, right? So our thesis is really that you're going to see a lot of money and a lot of innovation in the other parts of the data center. So we own the, uh, tr- three, or actually more than three stocks, but um, the three stocks that I'd highlight to you is Vertiv Holdings. So this is really the cooling systems, liquid cooling systems in the AI data center, which is super important. You have pure storage, which is solid state drives, and we also own Fabrina, which is the optical equipment um, inside the data center. So really, you're going to see all these areas catch up. Um, and it's, it's not just NVIDIA anymore. When it comes to semiconductors, Intel has been around for many decades. And yet they've kind of lost this battle. And it's really underperforming NVIDIA. Well, what's happening with Intel? Are they able to compete with NVIDIA? Yeah, the, the, the short answer is no. They blew their lead. And when you look at the history of semiconductors, usually when a company gets a lead in a certain sector, it, do, it usually stays there for a very, very long time. It's actually rare that, you know, within the verticals and semiconductors, you get change. So I really think uh, uh, Intel is not prepared for the, for the AI age. I think it's, it's, you know, it's been beaten by it's been beaten by NVIDIA on one side and TSMC on the fabrication side. So I think you w- there, there's a lot better stocks to own, not just in AI, but, but just in semiconductors in general. I think, you know, people maybe might be a little bit bullish on Intel because it's building all these fabs and it's spending all this money and it's getting all these subsidies from the government. 
I would say to you that a better bet is to buy the semi-cap companies, the, the, the machines, because 70% of one of these cutting edge fabs, 70% of the money, and we're talking $30 billion for a fab, 70% of that money goes towards the machines. That's companies like ASML and LAM Research and Applied Materials and KLA Tencore. They're the companies that are going to be earning all this money. So that, that's the better bet. So that's great. You provided lots of examples or other companies that we can invest in to capitalize on this whole uh, movement toward AI. But let's talk about AI and jobs now. And there's a lot of concern that AI will disrupt, disrupt the job market. And it seems like everyone I know in North America, they're looking for work, okay? And they're looking for good paying jobs and they can't find any. And I don't know what it's like there in Ireland, but uh, the job situation here, it's its not what you're, it's not as good as we're led to believe it is, okay? According, if you look at government numbers. And I guess my question to you is, is AI already disrupting the job market? Is it already displacing workers? So I think the fear about AI replacing jobs is completely overblown. I, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at Pessimists Archive. They wrote this great article about how job, how robots have about uh, been about to steal the jobs for a hundred years, and it's all these examples of every decade about people saying this technology or that automation is going to take all the jobs. And of course, what ends up happening is technology use you almost always creates more and better jobs. I think it's gonna be the same for AI. Look, I'm not saying it's going to destroy no jobs. I think if you, you put a gun to my head and um, I think customer service is one of those industries that will maybe have 10% of the workforce that it does uh, today and in five or 10 years. But what I'm really focused on, James, and what I think the world needs to embrace is that how AI is going to allow us to move up the value chain and actually help people that really need that help. For example, if you talk to teachers today, they spend less than half of their time actually teaching the kids, right? It's grading homework, it's designing lessons, it's, you know, all these rules and regulations that they have to comply with. What about if we could just automate all that away with ChatGPT, okay? Just, you can, you can design, not only design a lesson for the class, you can design it lessons for individual students based on where they are. So, you know, you might be ahead of me in math or whatever, you can design individual lessons for us. Wouldn't that be so much better? Similarly, in healthcare, um, here in Ireland, you're waiting, you know, two, two three years. In some cases, I'm not joking, for an appointment. What about if we create AI assistance to radiologists and doctors and automate away some of those lower level functions so they can actually uh, serve more clients, perform their jobs better? Um, so... I actually think it's, this is going to be an amazing thing for humanity. I think a lot of the BS jobs that we have are going to go away. But so, this technology will create so much prosperity um, that we will be more than better off than we were before. Yeah, you mentioned call centers and I'm deep into the Apple ecosystem. We, I, we probably have like 10 or more Apple products in this household. <laughs> and so every once in a while, I do have to phone their service line and i have to say they got the best service bar none and it's been that way for quite a few years but you always uh input your information you speak to some sort of automated bot or system right, right. and it, it looks after you like right away there's no pausing and if, if there is an issue if you do have to speak to somebody it'll put you on to somebody relatively quickly so they do a hell of a job yeah, I mean, look, Klarna, when they, they created the AI chatbot, they handled, I think it handled queries in 20% of the time and customer satisfaction went up. So again, look, it's going to be messy in the short term, but I would just, um, I would encourage people to go and look at the history of technology. And it, we always have these fears about things, yet we always seem to come out the other side better. Now, look, you, you could say to me, hey, but what happened in Detroit? You know, look, Detroit was, was America's richest city um, in the 1950s. And now look at it. There will, there will absolutely be winners and losers. Um, I think you can't just sit back and say, oh, everything's going to be great. You need to act um, to protect yourself and make sure you prosper. Um, because as always, there'll be winners and losers. So in the 1990s, a similar productivity and efficiency story played out with personal computers and the PC revolution. And that prompted many companies to adopt automation 
And I guess what you're saying is the same sort of thing that is going to happen with AI. Absolutely. And I think it's going to happen faster because you already have the infrastructure in place, right? You think about when you're adopting the internet, oh, we have to build our own server room. How do we even do that? What is a computer? We have to train everyone. Whereas now we already have cloud computing. Okay, and everyone already has a server room and everyone knows how to use a computer. So I think that's going to happen faster. And, you know, I gave you an example earlier of Alaska Airlines saving 500 uh, million gallons of fuel. What is American and Delta and United Airlines thinking now? We need this same system. And that's going to happen in every single industry, because if you don't use this technology, you are going to be falling behind. So I think it's going to surprise people. Um, how fast the adoption is. So let's look at the long-term implications. Everything we discussed now is the short term, but if we look out five or 10 years from now, how do you think AI is going to disrupt or change our lives for the better? I'd say three things, um, James. First of all, AI-powered robot taxis, self-driving cars. Right? 40,000 Americans die on the roads every single year. I think we can reduce that by 90% um, with robot taxis. Again, you literally have this car with eyes in the back of its head that never drink drives or never texts or never gets tired. So I think that's absolutely going to be thing. And I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be amazing. And, you know, anyone I, I know who's rode in a Waymo or whatever, uh, just says incredible. Like, why would I ever own a car again? Um, so I think that's, that's going to be a big thing. Again, it's slow. We're making progress, but it's slow because 99.9% .9 in this industry or, or this sector is not good enough, right? You, you can't ship a minimal viable product uh, in self-driving cars. So we're slowly inching our way, but that's absolutely going to be with us uh, in five years. Second thing I would say to you is AI designed drugs. So right now to get a new drug approved and on pharmacy shelves in America, you're looking at $2.7 billion in R&D and over 10 years on, on average, right? AI can really ingest mind-bending amounts of data, design new drugs for us, help speed up the regulatory process. This is already happening. There's already uh, over a dozen drugs, AI-designed drugs, uh, in pipelines, and they're doing it much, much faster. In fact, um, Google, Google DeepMind just spun out a new company that signed deals with, I think, no, um, Novo Nordst and, um, and Eli Lilly to, to, to basically design drugs quicker and faster. You just think about all the people in the world suffering from r some rare disease and the big companies are saying you know there's a hundred thousand people suffering from this why would i bother spending all this money all this time when there's only this tiny market so they get left behind right that's that's people that uh, are unnecessarily suffering now we can actually help those people so i think this is going to be it's going to be absolutely huge and the the third one that i'd say to you is i think ai is going to lead to a nuclear renaissance around the world simply because this stuff requires so much energy to operate. We're on about building, you know, Microsoft and, and OpenAI are on about building a, a data center for $100 billion, okay? Many, many football fields full of powerful servers, servers and cooling equipment and GPUs. Um, the only way to power that long-term is with nuclear power. And you saw Amazon uh, buy a nuclear power plant uh, with a data center attached in Pennsylvania. Um, they also designed an AI system to speed up the regulatory process. And on you've seen a huge U-turn from governments around the world on nuclear since AI has come along. So I think, uh, and just to, just to bring it home, that benefits us all because people might not know this, but nuclear is the cleanest, safest source of energy. And in fact, it also can be the cheapest if we were actually allowed to innovate in nuclear. So I think those are three things um, that within five or 10 years are going to become uh, quite apparent to everyone. So I'm sorry, where do you say Microsoft is building this $100 billion data center? So it, it hasn't broken ground on it yet, but the plans with OpenAI, it's, um, it's called Stargate, I believe. Um, it will obviously be built in America, but that's, that's the plan to do that. But just more broadly, bringing it back to today, um, these companies are putting up data centers by the dozen, right? Um, and they're, get, they're getting bigger bigger all the time. So the, the power needs are, are only going to grow. So let's move on now. I want to ask you about chat GPT. I haven't spent much time on this, but OpenAI just released a new version and, or an updated version. Tell me about it. Well, James, 
you have to promise me as soon as we're off this call, you are going to log on to ChatGPT because the most amazing thing, as I said, is that you can get access to the best AI system in the world for free. It's quite incredible. Um, look, the new, the new ChatGPT is incredible for one reason. It's a big practical boost, what you can actually do with it. Again, I would encourage people to go and check out some of the demo videos. There was one incredible one where a dad is sitting with a son and he asks them, so you can now share your screen with ChatGPT. So say your child's on, a, on an iPad at home, they're struggling with a problem. You can share, press a button, share your screen with ChatGPT. Hey, ChatGPT, can you please coach my son through this lesson? It knows exactly what you're looking at. You can provide it some information. Maybe your, you know, your your son's in sixth grade or whatever, and um, it, it helped helped this guy walk through the problem. That gives us all base, basically personalized tutors, right? You think about all the kids that come home and they have nobody to help with homework, or or maybe you know they get homeschooled and uh, and their parents are the best teachers. You basically just cloned the best tutor and gave it to everyone with an iPad and an internet connection. That's one big thing. The second big thing is it really breaks down language barriers, right? So again, w one of the demos was it, it real-time translated a conversation between English and Italian between two people. You think about when you're when you're in a, a foreign land, maybe you're in Spain or South America or whatever, and I, I'm sure like me, you've had these awkward conversations of asking for something at dinner or, or asking for directions, and it's always a hassle, right? Now you just whip out your phone, and the two of you can communicate in almost real time. It's almost like having one of those um, uh, those translators that the presidents have, right, when, when they meet. So, again, encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it really is an amazing tool. I will check it out for sure. Uh, you mentioned that it was free. I thought they were charging for that now. Yeah, so they were charging $20 a month for GPT-4. But as part of this new release, they said, we're going to uh, make the model free and available to everyone. And again, this is, you know, people might think ChatGPT is just a, a text bot. You can upload files to it. You can uh, talk to it. Uh, you can show it images. You know, if you have a, if you have a leaky tap or your, your son has a bike that he doesn't know how to fix, you can take a picture. Hey, ChatGPT, how do I fix this? Boom, gives you the answer. It is honestly incredible. I've never seen anything like it. So that's a good overview of ChatGPT. Are there any other AI programs that we should check out or be aware of? Yeah, ChatGPT is certainly the best one. And as, as I said, James, it's free. So that is, um, it removes a lot of barriers for people. I would also encourage people to check out Anthropic's Claude 3. Very good. Um, you know, it, it, I almost find it sometimes better for research if you're throwing large PDFs into it and asking them to summarize it. That's the other one I check out. But again, just just go with ChatGPT for now. Stephen, I want to move on now and get your views on cryptocurrencies. You and your team have done a lot of work on this space. And I want to ask you about Bitcoin specifically. We went through this whole halving process uh, about a month ago. And, and since that time, Bitcoin has been relatively quiet in terms of its price action. Why is that? Why is that? I, because everything I heard or read prior to this, uh, the whole halving process was going to take Bitcoin to new all-time highs. Yeah, so when you look at past halving cycles, James, it's really the case that it doesn't take off immediately, right? Bitcoin typically bottoms 12 to 18 months before the halving, rallies into the halving, and then once the halving happens, it, it, it does go up more. But again, we're only a month out, so I would I would give it some time. Um, I ultimately think Bitcoin might follow a little bit of a, a different cycle this time around, just due to the ETF flows. I mean, um, this has been the most successful ETF launch ever. And the importance of that is that before, you know, I, I talk to a lot of institutional investors and they're like, I'm not setting up a Coinbase account. Okay, I'm not taking the risk. Why would I take the risk? I'm just going to wait for the ETF. Now you unlock you bridge the gap, you break down the walls um, between the old world and the new world. Um, so I think this this has a long way to go. And ultimately, um, I think this might be a little bit of a little bit of a different cycle for Bitcoin um, in a good way. In a good way, I think we can actually run longer than anyone anticipates. So I, I got to ask you now, what's your target price? So we're currently trading between sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars. What's your target price here? Where do you think we go year end? Year end, year end over a hundred k. 
uh, in the next twelve months, one hundred and fifty, and I think we get a, we, I think we get a big pullback when we hit one hundred and fifty. Um, yeah, that's that's what I'm targeting. It's certainly not over. We're in the early days. That's good to know. So there's still hope for me if I buy it. <laughs> well, look, I'll give you, I'll give you the the elevator pitch for our thesis. Really, people think crypto. They think cryptocurrencies, digital money, all this stuff. Really, blockchain is a is a whole new way to build a business. So you know something people might not know about Ethereum, which is the second largest crypto. Um, it did a couple of hundred million dollars in transaction fees last um last month, and does does that every single month. You can think about Ethereum as as an app store, which like blockchain apps are built on, and there's tons of business in the crypto space that are making real money. Um, and, you know, I think these ETF approvals, the regulatory clarity that we're starting to get out of the U.S. is incredibly, incredibly important for the space, because until now, we've been kind of languishing in this gray area, right, where entrepreneurs are afraid to, to build products. A lot of the products aren't even available to Americans. So I think I think we're in an incredibly uh, good environment for crypto. Well, that's great. Very interesting comments. And listen, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. And Stephen, before I let you go, I got to ask you one thing. Every time I go to London, I'm always looking for a good fish and chip place. I haven't found one yet. And everybody tells me, no, you got to go to north. You have to go north to Scotland. Who makes better fish or chips, Scotland or Ireland? Going to be completely biased, James. I'm going to say Ireland. Irish potatoes are the creme de la creme. Um, if you ever come to Dublin, please check out Leo Bordox. That's my number one uh, recommendation for a fish and chip shop. Also, if anyone wants to come to Dublin, I'll, I'll bring you to the best Italian restaurant um, outside of Italy. Well, I might take you up on that. Well, listen, <laughs> if, once again, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. If someone would like to follow you online or learn more about you and your various services, where can they go? Sure, they can go to riskhedge.com. They can check out my, my free weekly letter, The Jolt, or they can uh, find me on Twitter, at Disruption Hedge, all one word. Once again, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, gents. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Steve McBride and providing with some insights on the whole AI revolution. To help determine how these new themes will impact the economy and also financial markets, we at Wealthion have organized a virtual conference in conjunction with SALT, and it goes live on June the 1st. We have some amazing speakers, including Raoul Paul, Lynn Alden, and also Rick Rule, and many more, all of which will help you navigate these financial markets during these uncertain times. Once again, that's June the 1st, and you can find out more information on our website, Wealthion.com. I want to thank you for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.